So it is good to see everybody, and we are now on YouTube. Thanks to Trish and Richard, who faithfully come to make sure, and, and I know they were having some issues, but I, Richard gave me the green sign. That's like a green light. So that's good. And Gerald, it's so good to see you. Ger Gerald Smith is here. He's back in the house. Seven weeks. Or, and you are driving now. Well, that's great. Improving every day, I hope. Good. That is great. <laughs> well, it's good to have Gerald back. And I wanted to let you know that some of you may not know that Ramona Phelps has been in the hospital. Uh, Ramona was here three weeks ago for the Bible study, and she ended up having to go to the hospital, I guess, the Sunday after Easter, wasn't it, Booty? At, or maybe it was the day before, on that Saturday, and had surgery early last week. And this, this is a message from her son. The last few days have been good ones. Nausea is all but gone. They're trying soft food tonight. She may get to come home late tomorrow or Wednesday if all goes well. So that's good news on Ramona, and we are thankful to hear that. And I'm glad to see you tonight, and hopefully we have a lot of folks that are tuning in. We normally, on our spring Bible studies, for those of you that have been around the block a few times... As some of you have. <laughs> we, we, we usually stop before Easter, but number one, Romans is going to take us a long time to get through. So I thought we'd have some more sessions. And so this is what we're planning to do. We're meeting, of course, tonight and then next Monday and the following Monday, the next two Mondays. We're going to meet and we're going to focus both of those Monday nights on the 8th chapter of Romans, which is without a, without a doubt the best chapter in the book of Romans, one of the best chapters in the Bible. Some of them want to know how Mark is doing. Oh, Mark. Yeah, I talked to Mark on the... This is Mark Fry. Talked to Mark on the phone Saturday. And, and he was riding around with his son, Charlie. They were doing some errands. And the, Mark is doing as well as can be expected following his bone marrow transplant. The, the issue now is he cannot get any kind of infection. He just has to be extremely careful. And it's going to be another two months or so before he's, he's, he really gets the green light. But my understanding is, he's, his, his goal is, he told me, he said, I'm, I'm waiting for the day when I can come back to church. And I also know he's waiting for the day that he can get back on the golf course and, and, and take on Tommy Wilson. <laughs> so let's hope and pray that that, that happens. So we're th thankful for that good news. Let's have a prayer together, please. Our Father, we are thankful on this beautiful evening for the opportunity to come and to open your word. We know that the book of Romans, it gets complicated at times, but the message of your love, your grace, your forgiveness always comes through. And so give us eyes and ears so that we can see and we can understand. And then give, give us hearts to respond to the Word. Thank you for our good news tonight. It's so good to have Gerald back with us. It's good to know that Mark is improving and that Ramona is doing better. And we know that there's so many others. We pray for each and every one. And we thank you in Christ's name. Amen. So I have a little show and tell. I was showing Dale this. Uh, this is a football program 
from October the 29th, 1966, Alabama versus Mississippi State. The program costs 50 cents. Oh. <laughs> and the kickoff was at 2 o'clock because they were only on television once or twice a year, if, if that much. But I've kept this program through the years, and, and it really is a novelty now. But if, if you look at it very closely, there are a lot of signatures on the program. When we would go to the football game, my daddy would take us to the football game. It was an all-day event. And when the game was over, we would go down to the locker room and wait for the players to come out. And Dave, they came out, they were dressed in white shirts and ties and red blazers. I think Dean Smith had you all always looking real sharp like that. It was not a request, it was a order. Yes, and in 1966, it was definitely an order. So the players would come out and we would get their autographs. And on this program, there's a name you may recognize, Ken Snake Stabler. And also down here in the corner, Ray Perkins. And then a lot of other names. Uh, Dennis Homan was a great receiver and uh, several others that you probably wouldn't recognize those names. But the reason I brought this is there's one name on here that under his name, it was Mike Ford, and he put a Bible verse. This is unusual that only one player put a Bible verse under his name. Uh, the year before, when Steve Sloan was playing at Alabama, he would always have a Bible verse. Most all of the players that were in the FCA, the Fellowship of Christian Athletes, would put a Bible verse under their name. And it, we as children, this had such a big impact on us. I mean, these were our heroes. But you know what we would do when we'd go to the football game? We'd carry a Bible with us. We'd have a Bible in the car, so when we got back to the car, the first thing we would do is we would look up the Bible verses that the players had put under their names. So Mike Ford put Galatians 6, 14. But far be it from me to glory, except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. That's a great, far be it from me to glory, except in the cross. And I know a lot of them would put the, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Uh, that was another Bible verse that they would use. And so that made quite an impact on us as children. In 1968, there was a football player at the University of Alabama who was a sophomore. Now back then, freshmen could not play on the varsity team. And so this was the first year that he could play. His name was Sammy Gillistead. And they said he had the potential to be one of the best football players in the history of the university. His sophomore year, he, he was all SEC and all American. And everybody said, Sammy Gillistad is going to be something special. And Sammy started putting a Bible verse under his name. Because he figured out if you put a Bible verse under your name, you're going to get invitations to go to churches and schools and to speak. So in the spring of 1969, after his great football first season, my high school had... Sammy Gillistad to come and to be a motivational speaker. Now that was back in the days you could have Christian speakers to come to your high school. 
I don't know, I don't remember what Sammy's Bible verse was, but it could have been Romans 6, 1. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? The problem was Sammy apparently didn't read verse 2. <laughs> Because Paul said, no, <laughs> by no means. And we're going to talk about that in just a second. So this is what happened. Sammy Gillistad was somebody who saw what all these other guys were doing, and, and he wanted to do that too. But the problem was, while he was a great football player, he was not a very mature person, and he had absolutely no spiritual depth at all. He didn't have any business coming to our high school and speaking to the students because this is what he said. He said, you know, I'm a Christian, so I'm forgiven, and I can do anything, and it doesn't matter because I'm forgiven. He said, I can go out and get drunk. And it doesn't matter. Well, you, you can imagine all these high school students, they're like, do what? And then, I, I'm going to tell you exactly what he said. He, he said, I can shack up with my girlfriend, and it doesn't matter because I'm forgiven. Well, by this time, the staff, they, they, they were like going into panic mode, and I think the principal finally ran up on the stage and said, well, thank you, Sammy. Thank you so much for being here. And they pushed him off the stage. So what Paul is actually addressing that mentality. What Sammy was saying is, but anything I do that's wrong, I'm forgiven for that. So it doesn't matter if I do it because I'm going to be forgiven. And Paul says, that is absolute nonsense. You see, Sammy was following the logic that actually some people followed in Paul's day, and the logic was... If action A results in B, and B is good, then why not do more of A? So if action A is sin, and it results in grace, and grace is a good thing, right? Then why not do more sin so that you can have more grace? That is what Paul was addressing. You would think, oh, by the way, let me tell you the rest of the story about Sammy. He never played another down at the University of Alabama because his, his attitude and his actions apparently were, were serious enough that Bear kicked him off the team. And when you have a player that has the potential of being one of the best players to ever walk on the field and he gets kicked off, uh, it must have been pretty serious. So maybe Sammy finally figured out. The interesting thing to me is Paul says, oh, no, absolutely not, by no means. This is in the second verse of the sixth chapter of Romans. He doesn't say you shouldn't do this because sin is bad. He doesn't say that. Now, it is, and he knows it is, but that's not his argument. What he says is, you cannot do this because it is not compatible with who you are. Because once you have received grace, once you have been transformed, you are a new person, and you have died to the old way of life. You all remember a number of years ago when you started seeing all these things on television that if, if you didn't get a, a box for your TV, if you just had a regular TV, uh, back, remember when we all had antennas? Well, if you just had an antenna, Tom, you still have those antennas. Well, did, did you, you had to get something to put on there, didn't you? Because the signal, now you understand this a lot better than I do, the signal changed from analog to digital. Is that right? Okay. 
if, if you didn't get that box, and, and those of us that have cable, you remember they made all of us for every TV we have, you had to get one of those little boxes and now they charge you for those. But if you don't have that little box, if, you, if it doesn't convert to digital, you can't watch TV. It's just absolutely not compatible. And that's what Paul is saying. He said, you have died to the old way of life. And so to sin is not compatible with who you are because if you look down at the end of the fourth verse, we now walk in newness of life. We have, and I'm going to talk about the, the image of death. We have been united with him in a death like his, and we will be united with him in a resurrection like his. The old way of life is not compatible to sin. He said, he doesn't say you shouldn't do this because it's bad. He said, you shouldn't do this because you can't. Because if you're dead, you can't do it. You're dead to the old way of life. It's not a good thing to wake up dead. <laughs> All right, you know the old joke about the first thing I read in the newspaper is the obituaries. And once I don't see my name, I can, you know, I, then I know I'm okay. When I was first year in seminary and I worked at the funeral home, the boys there knew that I had a routine every morning. Seven o'clock every morning, I would go to the cafeteria. That's when they opened the doors. Joyce can tell you, I was always on time. And I would pick up a news and observer. And the first thing I would turn to would be the obituaries. And the reason I would do that was because since I worked at the funeral home, I wanted to see if we were going to be busy. If I saw that we had a funeral that I didn't know about, I said, uh-oh, looks like I'm, I'm going to be working on Thursday or something like that. Well, they all knew that I read the obituaries first, and they said, wouldn't it be funny if old Ray picked up the News and Observer and saw his own obituary? So... These guys, and of course they worked at the funeral home, they knew how to do this. They called my obituary in to the News and Observer. Now what they didn't know was the guy who was the night editor was a student at the seminary. So he, it, it, you know, the copy comes across his desk. He has to approve it before it goes into the, the printed copy. And he sees that and he said, oh my goodness, old Ray died. And then he said, I wonder what happened to him. Wonder what ha I wonder if they know this at the seminary. So he calls a couple of people at the seminary, said, you know, Ray Howell, he, di he died. Yeah, I'm serious. I'm looking at his obituary. One of them said, well, you know, he works at the funeral home. Or he did said, we, I'm sure they know about the arrangements. I'm sure they have the body. So they decided to call the funeral home to find out what was going on. Guess who answers the phone? <laughs> I, I, I remember the call coming in and it just clicked. And I went, wonder what that was all about. And, and then... About 10 minutes later, the phone rings again, and, and I answer. And the guy said, uh, Ray, uh, is this you? And I said, yeah. He said, uh, well, uh, let's see. The reason I was calling is, uh, how, how about let's get together tomorrow? Uh, uh, why don't you bring the potato chips? I said, okay. And that was it. Well, the next afternoon, I went and bought some potato chips and <laughs> found those guys... What they were invited me to was an investigation. They said, Ray, something terrible has happened. Somebody tried calling your obituary into the News and Observer. We have to find out who it was. I knew who it was. You didn't have to do an investigation. 
But, of course, I wasn't going to turn those guys in, so I thought, oh, I just don't know, I just don't know. And, and it never got in the paper because the night after he finally pulled it. But it would have been neat if it had been in there. I would have had another show and tell for you tonight. <laughs> Y'all want to see my obituary? Here it is. So what Paul is saying is if you're dead, this is not compatible with who you are. But the thing I want you to notice here is the analogy, the example that he uses for death and new life. He's talking about baptism. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Third verse. We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we might walk in newness of life. The one distinguishing mark of every Christian is baptism. Now, we have baptism in our different traditions, in different ways, at different times, with different amounts of water. We all know that. But none of that is so important as the significance of baptism itself. Baptism is the symbol of us dying with Christ and being raised with newness of life. And if you come from a tradition where you're baptized as an infant, I think you, you look at a time in your life where you claim that baptism, whether it be confirmation or whether it be another time in life when that baptism suddenly it becomes very, very real. We had a young man in our church and I contacted his family and asked his permission for me to tell this story because most all of you will know him, Charlie Killebrew. Uh, you know Chad and Sheila Killebrew. Of course, Chad was the editor at the Dispatch. Sheila is now the head of the Davidson County Library. Uh, they are as active in this church as, as anyone. Their two sons, Charlie and Andy, Charlie's the oldest one, uh, they grew up in this church and they were involved with everything, with children's choir, Sunday school, Bible school. They got in youth group. We went on mission trips together, always involved in church. But as they, they, they got a little bit older, Andy decides to be baptized, the younger one. And he tries to get his older brother to be baptized, but Charlie said, no, no, I'm, I'm just not ready. Now's not the time. So Andy's baptized, but Charlie is not. So Charlie gets to be a teenager. He's still not baptized. He gets to be an older teenager. I remember Chad talking to me, saying, we have talked to him. His grandparents have talked to him. And... He just, it's just not his time to be baptized. And they were very, very concerned about it. When Charlie, I don't know if Charlie was a junior or a senior in high school, but we went on a mission trip to Belize. And this, this is a moment that I'll never forget. We were on a little island, a little key, off of the southern coast of Belize. Uh, it's, it's called South Water Key. We call it Gilligan's Island because it's, it's small enough to be Gilligan's Island. It's just, a, it, it, it's just like a picture postcard, you know, with the white sand and the palm trees. It's a beautiful, beautiful place. But I knew that not just Charlie, but we had, we had some other young people who had never been baptized. And so one afternoon... When they had all, I think they had gone snorkeling and then we'd been swimming. So I stood on the shore 
And I remember, I can't remember exactly what I said, but I talked about baptism in the New Testament. And I said, you know, baptism in the New Testament's not like baptism we have in our churches. Uh, they, they didn't have a real fancy baptistry. Or, you remember Jerry Clower? He called it that indoor swimming pool. He said, they, they didn't have anything like that. And, and baptism was not something that was carefully planned in advance and you get the whole family to come and you put everybody's name in the bulletin and you have nice music. I said baptism was many times spontaneous. It was out in the open. It was, it was something that every, it was just something that was so powerful it became transformational. And then I said... Who wants to be baptized? I will never, ever forget Charlie Killebrew literally ran into the water. He ran into the water. And it was one of the most authentic baptisms that I have ever been a part of. I told Chad and Sheila the only thing I regretted about it was that they were not there to see it. But a truer baptism there has never been. And, and I think back on the way that we have done baptisms, at least how we've done it here, and the, Charlie wasn't ever opposed to being baptized. What he was opposed to was institutional baptism. And when he was baptized, it was the real deal. I... I don't know, some of you probably remember when I first came here, I used to wear fishing waders in the baptistry. What was I thinking? <laughs> no, that was it. I, I didn't want to get wet. I, I was like, okay, okay, like, they're going to they're gonna see me out here. The next thing, they're going to see me up there. And then I'm going to be back here, just like Superman. And I'm not going to get wet. What kind of a message was I sending to those kids that were being baptized? Like, uh, like you have some kind of disease and I don't want to get close to you. I, I think you all know probably in the last 10, 15 years we've done baptism a whole lot different that I wised up and decided that wasn't the way that we were supposed to do it. When... Um, See Hal back there? You got a coat and tie on. When, uh, I told this story on Thursday morning at our men's Bible study, and Will Tate was there, and I asked Will, I said, Will, when I baptized you, did I have waiters on? He said, yes. I said, I'm sorry. <laughs> he said, I, I should have never, ever done that. But we have made it something institutional. And it's lost its power. And what Paul is talking about here, he is talking about an experience of dying to the old way of life, of being born to a new way of life. And baptism in its truest form is the most powerful picture of that that we can ever see. And I think about, and, and Charlie, thank you for giving me permission to tell that story. Because one thing I'll always remember was Charlie running into the, the water. We have had some baptisms in the Jordan River. And they have been powerful baptisms. And once again, I, I look back the first trip we went on to Israel. Peggy, you were on that first trip. We, we didn't do a baptism. I thought, well, no, we're not going to do that. And then the second trip, and Booty, you were on that trip, Gary Wickstrom came up to me before we left and said, I would like to be baptized in the Jordan River. So we'd made arrangements to do that. And I did take a bathing suit, but I didn't have any flip-flops. And Bob Team had a, he said, I got some flip-flops you could borrow. He gave them to me. I said, Bob, how old are these? You had these when you were in junior high school. I mean, my soul, they were so slick. And, 
And, and Tom and Ann, you, you know when we've been to the Holy Land, now they have that really nice facility where every church is assigned a different area. Well, back then it was basically just a boat ramp. And Gary and I were trying to walk down there. Walt, were you on that? You were on that second trip. So you remember this. Uh, you remember us going down there in the water? And I don't know who went down first, me or Gary. <laughs> but, but I'll tell you something else that happened on that trip. Y'all might remember this. When we pulled up into the area for the baptism, uh, somebody came up to me and said, are you folks going to have a baptism? And we said, yes. And said, well, there's a young lady on our bus, and she's never been baptized, and she wants to be baptized. And I said, okay. So I met her. I said, what's your name? She said, yo. I said, yo, yo, what's your name? She said, yo. Her name was Yo. <laughs> yo Caban. I'll never forget her name. And she had gone to the Holy Land. It was because of that experience that she had accepted Christ. And she had the opportunity to go down into the waters of the Jordan River and to experience that transformational moment, being died to the old way of life. Uh, when we were talking about this Thursday, Hal, you remember uh, Lee Jessup. Uh, Lee Jessup was one of the ones that was baptized the last time. Of course, Lee's been baptized, but he wanted to be baptized in the Jordan. And he said, what Paul is saying here is exactly what I experienced. I have a story to tell you. Not that I've told you any tonight, but I, I want to tell you about one of the most meaningful baptisms that, that I've ever experienced, and it was over 40 years ago. And we were in Pollocksville. Honey, we were out back of the parsonage. We pr it probably was the summertime. We were probably out there because stuff from the garden was coming in. And Johnny Parker rode in on his bicycle. Johnny was a kind, gentle, and a pleasant young man. I'm thinking then he was probably in his late 20s. People said Johnny was a retarded boy. We don't use that language anymore. Johnny had challenges, but like all of us that are limited in different ways. He made up for that with an overabundance of love and kindness. So now, Johnny didn't have any social skills. So it wasn't like, hey, Ray, how are you doing? He just rode up and got off his bicycle and looked at me and said, how you get that water in that pool? <laughs> and it took me a minute to realize what he was talking about. And I said, oh, you're talking about the baptistry over at the church. I said, well, you want to go see? So we walked over to the church, and, and I showed him the faucet, you know, where we turned the water on. And we had, Tom, you would love this contraption that we had to heat the water. It was a copper cubing around a gas stove, and we had to have a rubber pipe that went through by the hallway of the church to a, to a propane tank out the window. And it, it kind of looked like a still, you know, with all that copper tubing and all that. And, and you had to turn the thing on like Friday in order for the water to get warm by Sunday. But I was showing all that stuff. And, well, before I showed him that, he said, uh, is it cold? So after I showed all that to Johnny, he seemed satisfied. He left. A couple of weeks later, his father came up to me and said, I understand Johnny was talking to you about being baptized. And his dad said, you know, we've never really pushed baptism with him because there's just so much about it that he doesn't understand. Well, over the next few weeks, every now and then, Johnny would stop by and he might ask me one question. He might, might ask me more than one question. We went from the mechanics of the water to what you would wear to all the deep about when the baptism would be and the meaning of baptism. 
And then one Sunday morning, Johnny came up to me and said he was ready to be baptized. Well, problem was, in the institutional world, uh, we couldn't do it that quick. And I said, well, Johnny, this is what I want us to do. I said, at the church service today, at the final hymn, you just walk down front and I'm going to tell everybody that, that you're going to be baptized. Well, Johnny said, okay, and then he didn't show up at church. <laughs> so I'm thinking, he, 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 poor thing, he just he doesn't understand. But then his dad came up to me and said, he really wants to be baptized. So we planned a Sunday. When it came time for the baptism that Sunday morning, Johnny was scared to death. He was like a little puppy dog. I talked to him for a minute before the service, and I thought, he's going to disappear again. But when it came time for the baptism, uh, I, I went, did my Superman act, and went back in the back, and Johnny was standing there, had his white robe on, and I said, it's going to be fine. I said, give me just a minute to change. And I really thought when I came out of my office he might be gone, but he was there. So we both went up to the steps that went up to the baptistry, and I went into the water, and then I looked up at Johnny, and I said, come on. He was standing there like this, and I could tell he was shaking. And I said, come on, Johnny, it's going to be okay. And I held my hand out, and finally he took my hand, and we slowly walked down in the water. And when he got down on the last step and the water was about up here, he said, whoo, boy, this water's cold. <laughs> but Johnny finally settled down, he, and I said, Johnny, are you ready? And he shook his head. And I pronounced that Johnny Parker was being baptized in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And Johnny held his breath, and he went down under the cleansing waters of baptism. And then the most amazing thing happened. He jumped up out of the water, and he shook his head like a puppy dog. And then... He looked at both of his hands. It was like he was expecting everything to be different. And he just stood for a minute looking at his hands, and then I'll never forget, he had the biggest smile on his face. And he turned and he confidently walked out of the baptistry. There was a transformation that took place that day, and it wasn't just with Johnny. You see, Johnny was a child of God. He had always been, and he always will be. But as I stood before that trembling young man in the cool waters, the weakness that I recognized was not his, but mine. I wasn't the one that calmed Johnny down and lifted him out of the water. The congregation was also transformed. There was not a dry eye in the house. But there were tears of joy that punctuated a celebration of God's goodness and God's grace. And I think we all realized in that moment that in God's family, Everyone is favored. Everyone is blessed. And I really think if we had listened closely, we would have heard the words, This is my beloved child with whom I am well pleased. There's one more baptism I'll never forget. Yep. You're totally right. October 2nd, 2016. Hmm. It will live forever in my heart. Harold Bowen had been after Dave for I don't know how long, at least a year or so, telling him he really needed to be, he needed to be baptized 
the right way. But it was my decision, but he kept saying, yeah. but it's your decision. Yeah, because Dave's been, uh, he was baptized in the Methodist tradition, right? So Harold kept telling him, no, no, you, you need to be baptized in our church. Well, Harold's health was going down. He was on dialysis. But we made arrangements on that October Sunday. And I'll never forget it, Dave. Harold was right over here in his wheelchair. And we had, we had arranged this thing where, and I wouldn't do this for just anybody. But Dave had a Carolina shirt on, and I had a Carolina shirt on, but mine was covered up with a jacket. And, and, and so Dave and I, we both come out, and we're standing there, and Harold is just as happy as he can be. And, and we, we had a little, Dave said, Brother said, I, I thought you were, you know, I forget what you said, but, you, you know, in other words, I'm hiding something. I'll never forget unzipping that jacket, taking it off in the Carolina, and Harold Bowen had the biggest smile on his face. He, 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 just, he just started clapping. It was the best thing you'd ever seen. The other thing was, you don't mind if I tell them what you told me. <laughs> Dave said, I want you to hold me under. I said, man, you're a good guy. You're not that bad. I don't need to hold you under. He said, I want you to hold me under. Tell him what you said. I said, I want you to hold me under because life just passes by this quickly. It's something that I want to remember. And I want it to last at least a, a minute or so. He thought that was excessive. <laughs> but I really want it to be 45 seconds. So it's a very long yeah. He told me, he, he said, I want to, you said something about, I want to experience every second of that baptism. Well, he wasn't scared at all. <laughs> so Dave goes under the water. I'm holding him in there. <laughs> holding him there. Meanwhile, people out, the good folks here at First Baptist Church are like, what's going on? And there were audible gasps out in the congregation. And I thought, if I hold him under any longer, somebody's going to be calling 911, and they're going to be throwing hymn books up there to, to try to help him out. <laughs> he wasn't ready. <laughs> well, it was, it, 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 it was another one of those baptisms. It was, that's transformational. The other thing about it was, Harold loved every minute. We sang his favorite hymn, There's a Balm in Gilead. That was on Sunday. He died on Tuesday night. Never forget it. Remember what he said while I was under so long? He said, I had a lot of experience. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but, but you see, what Paul is talking about. We're buried with Christ in baptism, but we're raised with Him in newness of life. Well, come back next week. We'll talk about the eighth chapter of Romans. Thank you for being here, and thank you for tuning in, Richard and Trish. Thank you for making sure a lot of people can be a part of this. I hope you all have a good night.